right well let's get going then um because everyone's muted themselves and i just feel like i'm all alone somewhere apart from my elephants in the background there um i'm mike and you can find me at m1ke on twitter um i hang around on slack at the uh, og aws slack channel um which obviously as you may guess from the name is about aws um but it's just a generally good place to to hang out as well um, this live coding session is about real-time web applications and we're using WebSockets to build them. Uh, we're going to touch on mostly PHP, um, a little bit of JavaScript. Um, there's not going to be a huge amount of front-end in this talk. Um, I kind of want us to focus on the principles of uh, WebSockets and real-time applications and how we actually, as PHP developers mainly, um, are going to build those into our applications. So I didn't want to sort of confuse things with too much front-end. Hopefully, once you've seen some of the JavaScript code, you'll see how you could bake it into a front-end, um, whatever sort of JavaScript framework um, you happen to use. Um, this session is sort of a broken down version of a, uh, a full day workshop I do. So um, if anyone is interested, if this is something your team's interested in, um, do talk to me about that. Um, and yeah, thanks a lot for coming. Uh, it's really exciting to be able to speak um, at PHP Southwest. Um, I live in Manchester, it's raining here. I don't know what it's like in, in uh, Bristol or anywhere else in the Southwest at the moment. Um, I've always wanted to sort of visit uh, PHP Southwest, but it's, uh, it's not the easiest journey. Um, it's actually easier for me to get to London than it is to get down to Bristol. So um, it's fantastic that I can actually um, uh, speak to everyone here um, at some point. Um, so let's get going. So what I'm going to show you, it's uh, Sunny in Croatia. Fantastic. That's good. Well, I'm jealous. Um, so uh, what we're going to look at today is uh, WebSockets, um, but we're also going to look at a uh, WebSocket router. Um, now, I don't want to go into too much detail about this because you could pretty much do a talk just on the nature of a WebSocket router. Um, but basically, WebSockets is a connection protocol, um, allows your browser to have a two-way connection to a server. Um, traditionally with HTTP, we make a request, we get a response, and that's the end of our conversation. Um, sometimes we might say some session details, some state is kind of stored in either side of the uh, system. Sometimes obviously with SSL, you'll store some state around that as well. But generally, you can make a request to a server and never make another request again. And the server doesn't really know you've gone away other than that you've just not come back. Um, so it, it's a very one-sided relationship. Um, and actually we want a, a proper relationship. And so that's where WebSockets comes in. WebSockets allows your browser to make a permanent connection with the server. It means that at any point, the server can send you data without you having asked for it. Um, and obviously, at any point, you can send data back to the server, again, without the server having asked for it. Um, and at the point of sending this data, you can basically send anything. Um, so similar to TCP, um, it's kind of like a wire-level protocol where you could just shove any data down this, down this line, um, as long as you can sort of represent it uh, in, in, in text so you can compress it then you can send it down this line. Obviously, that doesn't necessarily make for a great application because it means that you know you might have a web browser client that's talking in one language and a server talking something totally different. So we need something like our HTTP that sits above and says, you know, here's my head, here's my body. Um, and there isn't a single standard for this, but the standard that has gained, I think, the most traction is uh, WAMP, Web Application Messaging Protocol. And I just love that it's called WAMP. I, I like saying WAMP. Um, and so a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about today is kind of a mix of WebSockets and WAMP. Um, most of what we're going to be dealing with is, is WAMP itself, but ultimately WAMP allows WebSockets to actually be a useful tool. Um, we're going to also use a router um, for WAMP, and the router we're going to use is called Crossbar. Um, Crossbar is a router that was um, designed for a wide variety of, of uses. Um, it can be used internally in a microservice architecture. Um, it can be used for IoT devices. Um, or it can be used as a uh, server that sits behind a WebSocket connection um, and talks to things like PHP code and talks to your users via their web browsers. Um, so we're going to be using Crossbar and WAMP. Um, there's a little bit of confusion around sort of WAMP and Crossbar because Crossbar is a company and it's also a router and the router implements WAMP, but the company is the company that wrote the WAMP specification. It's a little bit crazy, but ultimately just know the words Crossbar and WAMP and you should be good. Um, I'm using, as I say, a project that's kind of meant for a full day workshop. So we're going to jump around a little bit, but I'm going to try and explain everything as we go. Um, so to start with, I've already got a set of containers that are running. Um, if you want to see my container, which just might vaguely interest you, um, here's a fairly boring container that's going to install Python and it's going to uh, install Crossbar via pip here um, and a lot of other random stuff that your system needs to do work like curl. Um, and then it's going to run crossbar. Um, and 
that's already running in the background, but I can just restart it and get and tap into the uh, container logs by running this uh, bash script. And there we go. After a lot of stuff comes out, we can ignore all this because it's in debug mode. Um, first pro tip, if you are running um, cross in production, do not run it with debug mode enabled. Um, you will fill up any size hard drive you can care to throw it. Um, it just spits out everything in a very high detail. But for developing, um, it's maybe useful. Um, but for teaching, it's really useful because I can show you a lot of the internals of what Crossbar is doing. Um, and so we are going to go to our browser. Um, and hopefully you can see that. Uh, let's restart this. Okay, so great. So our browser has told us that it's open to WebSocket connection and it's given us some parameters. So we're going to get this like uh, session object, which has all this random stuff in it that might mean nothing to us at this stage in time. Um, and we can learn a little bit about what WAMP is. Uh, WAMP essentially allows two forms of communication between uh, a uh, client and a router. Um, and the, this, this communication is kind of, I say, is, is sort of bi-directional. Sometimes you're um, telling the router something, sometimes the router telling you something. So for example, you have PubSub. Um, PubSub is a, a sort of very common format. It's not in any way unique to WAMP. Uh, there's lots of different PubSub services out there. R um, Reddit has PubSub. Reddit? Redis has PubSub, um, if anyone is using that. Um, and PubSub essentially means I can publish something to a named channel, and anyone who has previously subscribed to that named channel receives the thing I publish. Um, so, you know, an obvious example would be a chat service where um, a lots of people um, would subscribe to a chat thread or a channel, and I can send a message and they'll get it. You know, we're doing that right now with uh, Zoom. Um, and, you know, if you send a message to me in Zoom, uh, I get it because I'm already subscribed. If I've got Zoom closed, I don't get that message. Um, if you send that message and no one's subscribed, the message still gets sent, just no one receives it. Um, so that's PubSub. Um, WAMP also defines uh, RPC, Remote Procedure Call. And that allows one person to say, I'm going to register a function. And so you register a function and you have a handler on your own machine that's going to carry out that function. So I could register a function that adds two numbers. And I tell the router, I've got this function. If anyone wants to call it, they can call it. And then anyone else can say, hey, I, I've got these two numbers. I really want to add them. And they can send a call to the router and the router goes, ah, oh, someone's calling this add function. Well, it's on this person's machine. So I'm going to send this person the two numbers and they're going to run this function. Now, obviously, at this point, the router is just passing data. So the router isn't doing the add function. The, the, the code you're um, registering when you register a procedure is never going to the router. Just the fact that you have a function is going to the router, and the router can then send calls your way. Obviously, that means you could totally lie. You know, you could trick people. You could register a function called add, and you could subtract the numbers. Jokes. Um, but obviously, that would be fairly pointless. In reality, you're going to find that most architectures using this, the kind of things you're going to build yourselves, are probably more going to lean towards PubSub than RPC, uh, mainly because things that generally work for um, publishing, such as chats, uh, real-time dashboards, tend to be in that kind of PubSub style. Um, RPC can be used alongside that, though. For example, um, for the company I work for, uh, we have a chat application, and we actually do use RPC because it allows you to um, discover more details about a user without having to make an AJAX request to our web server. Um, so uh, the uh, sort of a, a worker registers a procedure that says, you know, I can give you some information about users, and you can ask that worker for the information about users. Um, we could implement that in many of the other ways. And that's one of the other common things about um, the WebSocket systems, real-time systems. You could implement most of this in a different way. If you wanted to go and build this system and just do uh, AJAX long polling, you could generally do it. Um, but if you want a really interactive system, and I mean, we are in 2020 here, people, um, then you want to look at something like WebSockets. Um, and especially if you're doing something like a mobile app or um, a PWA, a uh, progressive web app, um, this kind of feeling of like a live communication channel is really going to give you uh, just a much better way to interact with your users. So let's actually have a look at how it works. Um, we've got our website open. We've got a connection that the site's done automatically for us to our uh, server. Um, and we can actually just refresh that. And you can see in the logs here um, that there we go. I've just got a log here um, that someone has joined. Uh, so I've got a session that's just joined. And it attached it to a realm. Uh, realms are just names. They're just text names. Um, so this says there's a realm called WS Workshop, um, WebSocket Workshop. Um, I couldn't be able to type in WebSocket. And uh, this user has joined this realm. Uh, realms are just a way of segregating 
uh, users in your uh, routing architecture. Um, so when you define things like uh, authentication, which we're going to get to in a bit, you can say these users can authenticate to this realm. Um, in, in general, like in, in our case, we have a WebSocket server that has a single realm. We just put everything in one realm. But you could split it up if you wanted to, if you, especially if you're running a multi-tenant application. Uh, you really might want to have different realms, maybe for different end users and clients, that kind of thing. So there's definitely uses of realms, but uh, for, for the purpose of this, realm is just going to be a fairly minor, minor point. Um, so we're connected to this and we can subscribe to a channel. And again, when you subscribe to something, it doesn't need to exist. So by subscribing to test, all I'm saying is if anyone ever publishes to something called test, then I want this message. So I'm telling the router, so crossbar the router, I'm telling the router, I'm, I'm subscribing to this channel. So I do that. Um, and I get a uh, promise returned that basically allows me to check whether my subscription has been successful. I'm not going to bother in this case because I kind of trust it. And again, if I switch over to the logs here, I can see, uh, here we go. So Crossbar's got my message um, and it's decided to authorize it. So it's checked, am I allowed to subscribe to this channel? Um, and then it's, it's decided to say, yes, I can. And it's registered that subscription internally. Um, and so now I can do publish. So I can publish and I can publish to the same channel and I can publish anything here. I'm going to publish uh, just a string ABC. And this exclude me is uh, basically an argument. that's going to say, obviously I'm publishing. I don't necessarily need to receive my message back. Um, so if I said exclude me true, uh, Crossbar would not send me my own message back. Um, but actually sending my own message back does two things. Firstly, it means I can write one set of logic for how I handle any message, including whether it's mine. Um, and secondly, it kind of proves to me that I've actually sent it. So if I send this, I should get this uh, function called subscriber says got a message with some arguments. And there we go. So I've got a message. So that's, that's basically crossbar has received my message here, ABC, and it's found that I'm subscribed to test and it sent me it back. And therefore it's called this callback function. So I can open this and see all the arguments that got passed to that. I can see that my array ABC that I've published has been sent back to me. Um, I can also see, uh, and an empty object. I can see some details about the publication. So who published it? Um, what, what, what was their role or authorization? None of it. Um, and what topic did it go to? Um, how can I unsubscribe to that topic? So you get a lot of information that you can use to build sort of an application uh, whilst you're interacting with Crossbar. Um, and again, if we look at the Crossbar logs, we can see what happened here. Um, it checked whether I was allowed to publish for test to use the URI. And it granted me that, that ability, and then it dispatched. And it gives me a list of exactly who it's dispatching to as well. Uh, you can see here that if you have any number of, any amount of scale, debug logs would absolutely kill your system because there's the amount of stuff that it records. Uh, but this is really handy for you know, debugging. Um, and just to prove that I'm not just making this all up and this is all just running in some JavaScript, um, here it is in a different browser. And again, I can run the same publish here. And I don't get any response here because I didn't subscribe here, but I can see here, that I received another message. So that's how we can publish and subscribe. Let's have a look at RPC. Um, RPC, the code is a little bit more verbose to, to register something. Um, so here I'm gonna register another function called test. Um, nothing to do with the test here. They're just strings. They don't actually have any relationship to each other. Um, basically, I'm going to um, say that if someone calls me, I'm gonna return the number one. So I'm even worse than an addition function. Um, I'm just returning one. Um, and this is just a promise handler um, that's going to tell me that I was successful in registering the, the uh, procedure. Um, yay, register my procedure. Cool. Uh, so, so someone can call it. And let's, let's again just go over to our Chrome tab here and call it here. So I'm going to again send, I'm going to send one and ABC. Um, and again, I'm going to um, deal with, I'm going to get a promise back. And this time the promise is the going to be the return of that function or an error. And there we go. I got an answer with arguments and the argument I got was, oh, look, one. And that's the same as I defined here, return one. And I also got this call provider said, someone's called me with these arguments. And we see we've got one and ABC, which is the arguments I sent uh, here. And I had nothing to contribute, so I returned the number one, which is exactly what we said here. So you can now see that anyone can uh, register this procedure and then anyone else can call it. And at that point, we could kind of just clock off and go off and build an application around this. But we'd probably find in the real world that putting a server online that allows anyone to publish or subscribe to anything and anyone to register a procedure for anything would result in just an absolute mess. Um, I believe someone did that once and called it Twitter. 
Um, and so we want to do something a little bit different. We want to have some rules, maybe um, some ways to enforce logins, um, some ways to enforce what people can and can't do. Um, should everyone be able to register a procedure called add? Uh, pro probably not. Um, should everyone be able to subscribe to any thread they can think about? Probably not. Uh, maybe there should be some limits. And so we're going to look into uh, some authentication. Now, authentication in Crossbar is, is uh, providing a variety of methods. Um, again, in my full talk, I go over all of them. But in reality, there's only really one you're going to want to use. Um, and that is an authentication method known as, uh, I'm going to type it because it's easy, easier to say it. Um, it's authentication called WAMPCRA. Uh, or is it authentication? One of those two. But anyway, really long acronym, um, WAMPCRA. Great name. Um, and what WAMPCRA allows you to do is have someone send you a pre-shared key. Um, okay, so this is essentially um, a password login, but where the password doesn't actually go over the connection. Um, and that's obviously good for all sorts of security reasons. Um, WAMP and Crossbar do also support another authentication method called Ticket, where you just send a plain text password. Um, that's not good because it appears in things like the logs. Um, and generally, you don't want to log people's passwords. Um, so we're going to implement WAMPCRA um, into our uh, router. Um, and Crossbar's router is controlled by a config bar. Um, and we can declare workers. So this worker is a router. And yeah, we go, there's our realms. And we've got a name, WS Workshop. And we have a role. So this is the previous role we were signed in as, and it was a guest uh, because just anyone could sign in as it. Um, and we have, this role was allowing you to do everything, call, register, so that's, that's RPC, publish, subscribe, that's PubSub. It was allowing you to do all of those things on any given URI. Um, we also have transports. Um, so transports allow people to actually access uh, your router. So in this case, we have a web transport that's um, Allowing connections at port 8000. Um, obviously, we're going through uh, Docker, so we're remapping those ports anyway. Um, and we're going to define it. We are defining a URL that people are going to hit to get to our site. And here we've just said that our um, authentication is anonymous, so it's a static authenticator, and everyone gets the role of guest. Right. So that's what we're doing. That's a little bit unsophisticated for our purposes. So let's try and beef this up a little bit. Um, we're going to create a new realm. Um, so having just told you that realms aren't that helpful, we're going to make a new one. And this realm's going to have a few different roles. So we're going to have a see things role. And this, this see things users uh, still have access to any URI, but they're going to be able to call but not register. And they're going to be able to uh, subscribe but not publish. And we're going to have a do things, which is basically the inverse. Um, and we're just going to use that to demonstrate how you can sign as different users. Um, so we can also uh, define our WAMPCRA authenticator. So we've got our anonymous authenticator. So essentially, what this says is if someone signs in anonymously, they get this guest role. Uh, whereas if someone signs in as a static user, and we're going to have Barry and Steve, and um, Barry's password is not so secret, and Steve's is slightly more secret. That's just because it's longer. Um, neither of these are actually good passwords. Please don't use them. Um, and we can now set up our um, front end client to handle this. So, firstly, we're going to run, and then we'll just move on to lesson two here. So, once again, we run our router. Make sure nothing crashes. Okay, great. Uh, it's running and we've got our router accessible. So we're going to move on to next lesson two in here. And so it's by default, it's opened our connection once again as guest. Um, and we don't want to do that. So we were going to change it. And I'm going to paste some code in here and then I'm going to explain it before I call it. So we're going to set our config. So this WS workshop is again just a little helper function I've written. Um, but we're going to set a config. So our realm is going to be somewhere else. So this is important to match. So the front end needs to know what realm it's connecting to. So somewhere else, this matches our new realm name here, somewhere else. We're going to provide an auth method. So again, previously our auth was just saying, I, I want the sort of anonymous authentication. I don't want to give you a username and password. Um, we're now we're saying, I want bump credit authentication. And what I'm going to say is when I get challenged, so I'm going to get challenged by the server to say, hey, who are you? Uh, when I get challenged, I'm going to return. Also, barn is the library we're using on the front end to connect to our um, router. And it's going to uh, sign a challenge. So the back end is going to send us a challenge. We're going to use a, um, a hashing algorithm or a signing algorithm to 
use our password and sign a challenge. And the server knows our password, we know our password. What this means is that no one who intercepts our communications will know our password. And I'm gonna again give it my auth ID so the server knows whose password to compare it against. So this is gonna set this config and then it's just gonna reconnect. And there we go. Website can actually open to Realm somewhere else, as role, do things. And we can see that that matches up here with um, Steve. So I sent slightly more secret and I am allowed to do things. So Steve should be able to um, publish but not subscribe. So let's try publishing. Oops, session is not defined. Um, ah, WS workshop. Publish. Yay, publish a test. I didn't publish anything. Send some words. Oh, must be an array. Isn't live coding fun? And there we go, I've published some words to test. But I want to subscribe, I want to see what I'm sending. I can't. Oh no, subscribe on test went wrong. I got these arguments. So I can open this. Wamp error not authorized. And that's because, as we've said, I am do things. I cannot subscribe, but I can publish. Um, if I now go into my other channel here, and I go to uh, Barry, and I think it was not so secret. I'm gonna copy and paste because I'm generally terrible at typing, and my hands are kind of cold at the moment. Oh, it's Photoshop, and so we're gonna sub to test. And now we're going to pub to test. Oh no, I can't. But if our good old friend Steve over here publishes, Barry receives it. And so that way these two, two users have different permissions um, and can therefore interact in different ways. So for example, in a, a service like right now, we're on Zoom um, and I believe that uh, some people, uh, myself and Dave and Stefan, can, uh, can send some level of messages and we can share our screens, whereas other people can't. So there's a permission system going on in there as well. So that's essentially the same thing we've created here. Now, this is all very well and good, but what you don't want is a JSON file with every single one of your users, your usernames and passwords. Uh, because A, that'd be really hard to maintain. Uh, it would probably violate a whole host of uh, GDPR or other rules, um, and it would expose you massively if anyone ever got hold of this file. So we don't actually do that. Uh, instead, we're going to use a custom authenticator via PHP. Um, in order to do this, we need a long running PHP process and PHP isn't exactly known for that. Uh, generally in PHP, you stick it by a web server. So it makes a request to your website and PHP runs. And this either might be PHP FBM, which kind of runs a service, but then loads your PHP files. Um, or in the, I guess the slightly more common, uh, but kind of maybe like fading from fashion aspect, you run it through something like Apache um, and that connects to um, uh, maybe our live Apache, sorry, live PHP and uh, loads your PHP code inside the Apache interpreter. Um, either way, your PHP code lasts for a very small amount of time, unless you have some big database queries, in which case it might last for a few minutes. Uh, but what we're thinking about here is a permanent PHP application, um, which might bring you more to the long lines of things like Node or Go, where you actually run a server um, kind of it written in the language that you're also doing your application code in. Um, PHP can do this. Um, there is very little reason why PHP can't do this. Um, and there are now a few libraries um, and even a uh, backend extension, um, which will allow PHP to run as a sort of proper um, asynchronous backend system. Now we're going to use the, um, I think it was one of the first uh, libraries to do this, React PHP. Um, and there's also, um, if people are interested in checking out this world of kind of event driven PHP, there's also Swool, which I believe is a PHP extension. Um, I, you can tell I haven't used that myself. And then there's also Drift PHP, which again is another front end library. Um, Drift PHP actually is kind of more of a framework, which then can run on top of things like React. Um, so we're going to look at an authenticator. And what that's essentially going to do is we're going to run a service alongside Crossbar that says, I'm written in PHP. Um, and obviously you could write it in any language, but this is PHP Southwest. Um, and it's going to run in PHP and it's going to act as an authenticator to say, I'm going to get some people's details for you and tell Crossbar whether they're allowed. Um, so let's get going with that. The first thing we need to do um, is, we're switching over to our lesson four here. Um, we need to uh, tell Crossbar to run something else extra. Um, crossbar, as you've seen from the top, has these workers. So the router itself is a worker, 
Um, so Crossbar is basically uh, similar to something like Supervisor D, um, which can run multiple programs and kind of keep them running for you, um, or Docker Compose or something like that. And so we can actually give it another parameter to say, I want to run something else. I'm going to run a guest. Um, and obviously, the router is a kind of defined type. Crossbar knows what that is, and it has its own code internally to run a router. A guest is basically just run this executable. Um, so we're going to run user bin env with arguments PHP and a file, and then a load of these are just literally positional arguments that get passed to our PHP file. Um, and here's a bit of a scaffolding that I've created earlier. Um, so we need to add a line here to grab the command line creds that we put in. And we're going to do this. So basically, we've got these URL, realm, username, password. This is just a random string I generate. Um, it can be fixed, it's totally fine. And then you can see that PHP here has kind of the same thing we've got going on um, as we already had for uh, our JavaScript. So we've got a function which receives a session and a challenge. And if it's not Lampcra, it's going to give up. Uh, but if it is Lampcra, it's going to create an authenticator and it's going to sign it and return the signature, right? So you see that our, even our PHP authenticator is actually going to be um, dealing with the same authentication systems. So Crossbar really is a kind of central point. The, the, even an internal privilege process like our PHP worker doesn't have any special access in this case. Um, we, we could turn off WAMCRA for it and let it authenticate as a guest, but then anyone running malicious code on our server could also authenticate themselves as our authenticator, and that wouldn't be a good one. So we're going to run, uh, run this in that way. Obviously, if someone owns your server, there's other ways they can get you, but yeah, let's pretend. Um, so we also need to have, an, have a, a way to allow this to authenticate itself. Um, and so I'm going to copy in some more code. Um, we're going to have a, I've got to get these right. Isn't JavaScript fun for big nested things? Um, there. So basically you're going to add another um, connection interface here, um, which is going to have a static internal authenticator um, for our authenticator program. And it's given a role of authenticator. And that's a special role um, because we're going to allow that role to authenticate other people. So here at the start of our roles, we're going to do this. I'm going to have an authenticator and it's got permissions to register a procedure. Finally, we're going to replace our authentication for our first transport um, with this. Again, this kind of stuff is really, uh, in some ways, more helpful if you can like type it all yourself. Um, Obviously, you're kind of having to watch me type it, um, but it is a lot of stuff. And I think if I just typed it all out, uh, we'd just we'd we'd be here all evening. And you know, whilst I'm sure many of you have nothing better to do, some of you might do. So you know, we're we're not going to do that. Um, and we're finally going to delete our guest role because you know we don't need a guest anymore. Um, now that we're going to have some more sophisticated authentication, having this get having sophisticated authentication and then having a thing called guest with full permissions probably doesn't work. Um, that's the kind of thing that leads you to getting breached in the future and having your name in the papers for the wrong reasons. So we're going to add a type A user um, and they're going to be able to do a certain set of things um, and we'll kind of add to that in the future. And there's a blocked user just so we can have a sort of way of indicating that there's a way of saying, hey, you're this user, but you can't do anything. So we are going to just restart our router now. This is just to make sure that we've actually got uh, we've not made a mistake in all this code because at the end of the day, I'm copying and pasting massive blocks of JSON. There's a good chance I'll make a mistake. Okay, so it's booted correctly. Um, we can go on to our lesson four. Oops. That's when I realized I haven't cleared some browser history. Um, uh, well, lesson four. So we're going to try and connect and just to demonstrate it doesn't work connection um, because, oh dear, no such procedure. No quality register procedure at workshop.auth. Okay, so why is that happening? Well, we've told our server now that no longer are you just authenticating anyone. You're going to use a dynamic authenticator, and it's going to have an authenticator with a procedure register called workshop.auth. 
So you saw earlier, we registered a procedure called um, test, or you could register a procedure called add, but in the same way, we're going to register a procedure called workshop auth, and the system is going to use that as our authenticator from now on. Um, so let's go back to our PHP code. Um, so we've got our um, React PHP uh, script. Now you actually see there's no React in this, and this is because we're using things that are built on top of React. Um, so React is kind of running under the hood. So when we uh, open a, connect, a WAMP connection here, um, if we actually drill into this, uh, we see that this uh, WAMP connection expects a loop interface, and this is part of React PHP's event loop. Um, essentially an event loop is a sort of slightly fancier way of doing this. Um, so obviously you could do that and just do stuff will just be called forever. Um, but generally you want a little more sophistication when you're actually running, writing an event-based system. Um, you know, you want to think about how often something works. Um, you want to think about um, maybe doing something on user input. You might want to have certain things checked. So um, maybe you want to run something every minute or every two minutes and you want two things to run and one of them's every minute, one's every two minutes. Um, so having just a while loop, just hammering your system, it's probably not the way to do that. Um, a proper event loop system is good. Um, you could write your own event loop, but I would recommend using React PHP. Um, and in this case, we are using our event loop to bootstrap a connection to our um, web, WebSocket server. And again, we've got our Realm and our URL. And what we're going to do is we're going to open our connection and we're going to register a procedure. So just like we've seen earlier when we registered our addition procedure in JavaScript, we can do the exact same thing in PHP. So I've got session and I register and I register a procedure called Workshop Wolf. And it's going to return this array with role and secret. And essentially, this is the same as what we did before when we typed a role, um, so Steve, and a secret, or you know, not so secret, into our crossbar JSON co configuration. Um, so it's going to register this, and it's going to report back. So let's see that work. And there we go. So our authenticator has said, I register procedure workshop.auth. Um, and so now if we try and sign in, um, as our won't work, you see our error message has changed. Our signature is invalid. And the reason for that is that we've got the wrong secret. We're expecting the secret ABC. And we're in, we are given type A role. And the reason we're given that role type A is because this has returned that type A role. So essentially, this doesn't really care at the moment who I am. So my user, my, my name, uh, I've, I've called it whatever. So I could literally just put anything in there and it would still work. Um, but basically, our authenticator has received this uh, a message. And no matter what message it gets, it just returns this. So now every single person who signs in, uh, as long as they sign in with the secret ABC, gets this type A role. Doesn't matter what, uh, who they say they are. So let's make that a little more sophisticated. Firstly, let's get some information to our uh, console so we actually know what we're doing so we're going to grab the function arguments um, which i believe are there. so gra grab some function arguments and then we're going to log them out so we can see what's going on so once again we have to reboot this uh, rebooting stuff uh, is, is going to be pretty common. Um, if you're running it in, in Docker, uh, it's fairly easy to do that. Um, so you know, sign, sign in again. And you see this time we can see the message that we've uh, received here. So um, there we go. You see how much extra stuff it adds. Received auth request for user blah, 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 on Realm WS Workshop. Crossbar session was this number. So I've got the crossbar session number because crossbar's already got this user that's trying to connect. So it's given them a session ID even before they've been authenticated to do anything. Um, and then it's given me their information. So I now know their name. Um, I don't know their password because remember the password is only sent in response to the challenge that I'm gonna give them. And so I'm gonna add a new function here, which is gonna give me a token from a user. So let's add this function up here and then we're going to put this in here. Okay, so it's going to get a token from a user. If it gets an exception, it's going to block them. Um, otherwise, it's going to return their token. 
Um, and I've called my user Alice, as in Alice and Bob. Um, and so the password is change me, uh, a classic, a classic password, change me. So let's be Alice and we can see if we use ABC, it will fail. Uh, oh, didn't fail. Oh, see, told you. Once again, restart our server. Not authorized, signature is invalid. Change me, and now we're in. Um, and so now we have a dynamic authenticator. Um, and sort of in the uh, the best uh, sort of Blue Peter formatting, I don't even know if that's a relevant quote anymore. Um, here's one I made earlier, um, where I've actually hooked this into a larger application. Um, and I'm gonna kind of push on because I know that we are sort of pressing for time a little bit. Um, so here's the kind of the fully built application where we've got a little, little more fancy um, in, in our lesson five. Um, and what this does is it's gonna register our authenticator. Um, let's actually have a look at the code that does it. So similar to what we've just written, token from user, but now token from user does something else. Um, we've hooked up our token from user as if it's Alice or Bob, we added Bob. Um, we return their password and different user types. Um, but actually if we um, want to uh, authenticate like real users, we're gonna to talk to our web application. Now, there's different ways to do this. Now, obviously your, your crossbar um, service could simply just go and talk to your database. Um, but the chances are you already have an application that's running somewhere that's dealing with things like user authentication. Um, and in the sort of like microservice approach to things, you probably don't want your crossbar system to become really heavily coupled into your authentication logic. Um, crossbar is its own way of doing authentication, tokens and signing. It's quite different from the way your application probably handles authentication, which most likely uses um, sort of a, like password fields and uh, maybe sessions, uh, potentially something like JWT. Um, so what we're doing here is we're sort of sideloading our authentication to our main application. And the good thing about this is that it means your application doesn't have to uh, dramatically change. You just have to provide a new endpoint. Um, and obviously if you're running everything inside a sort of a network, you could secure that endpoint to only be accessible from Crossbar. Um, but you don't have to because again, you know, users could uh, can authenticate in different ways. So in our case, I've made a sample application here. Um, well, actually, it's up here, isn't it? Um, so this is um, using the Slim framework. Um, for anyone who hasn't used Slim, it's fantastic for building something super quick, especially to demonstrate something. Um, but actually, in terms of microservices, um, Slim provides all, all that you need for a sort of simple microservice. Um, so yeah, if you haven't checked out Slim and you're sort of just you know sort of knee deep in uh, in Laravel or Symphony, um, go have a look at, at Slim. You might be pleasantly surprised. Um, so in this case, we have a, a simple application that lets you register a user with a post request and lets you log in, which gives you a token. Um, and then it has another method which is only callable internally from Crossbar, uh, which checks your token against your user. Sorry, returns your token for your user. So let's demonstrate this whole procedure. Um, here's some code requests I wrote earlier. Uh, we're gonna sign up as user Mike and it's gonna return a password uh, and it's telling me the token. It doesn't, I don't need to know my token and generally you wouldn't disclose this um, at this stage to your users, um, but I'm gonna save my password there. Um, I've also written a little login method in JavaScript, which is gonna get my token for me. So you, you often think about these tokens, they, they might not be a permanent feature like a user's password, um, in, when in our application, we sort of generate them at a time a user tries to sign into chat. So it's sort of short lived token. Um, so I could say login as Mike. I can use the password I've just, written, just got. And you don't really know, have to know what that does, but you can see that it essentially does a post request and receives a token in response. And that's just a way of configuring my um, JavaScript here so that we don't have to do loads of the boilerplate. Um, that is a continual feature of WebSockets. There's lots of boilerplate in everything you do. Um, so you, you know, obfuscate it behind um, interfaces and abstract it away as, as soon as you can, or you'll you'll drown in callbacks, um, especially in JavaScript. So we've got that token successful, um, and so now we're going to actually um, set our auth, and we should just be able to go to this workshop, connect, and there we are. So we're tech connected as a type three user. Okay, how did that happen? Let's have a look at some logs. Um, are we in the logs list? Uh, that was the wrong set of logs, wasn't it? Lesson five logs. Connect again. 
Okay, what happened? So our user called um, an authentication method. Our authenticator here, um, authenticator here went into the register auth and where it already registered this procedure. So this procedure was already registered to the router. Um, it received this auth request for user Mike and it went off to this token from user and it passed my name. My name wasn't Alice or Bob, so it passed it onto my application. Um, and my application received a request to say, um, hey, I'm your internal um, user. I'm your, um, uh, your crossbar authenticator. Uh, I need to get the user information here. Um, now, obviously, again, there's other ways you can secure this. You can put a password on it, um, various ways. But we're just using port blocking because we're using an internal network inside Docker. Um, and what I do is I look in my database um, using SleepDB, which is a JSON data store. Um, and I'm going to return, I'm either going to go 404, so just standard HTTP here, or I'm going to return the user's token. And in this case, you can see the authenticator got the token. So I'm returning token E81. Um, so now, again, the user had that token, the server had that token, and so Crossbar could authenticate the user. Um, we also added a bit of extra uh, things because obviously just authenticating users isn't so good if you still have to have really specific roles. Um, so we actually developed a um, um, a similar function for for permissions. So previously we had this big config where we said things like call, register, publish, subscribe, true, false, true, false, URI. Oh my goodness, you know that'd be complicated to manage over a whole application. So in this case we actually have some logic. We can say I want this to be our uh, permission handler as well. And it's going to get a user request um, for something. So let's try and I don't even know what this user's allowed to do. Let's just try and do something. Here's workshop. Let's just, let's pub. Pub to test, and we're going to send ABC because I have no imagination. Oh no, it went wrong. Okay, I'm not authorized public to publish that. Okay, why not? Let's have a look. So we get our log here. User Mike wants to publish. I'll just highlight it so you can see it on this endpoint. So that's what I want to do. And can I do it? Well, if actions publish and the start of the URI is not workshop chat, oh, no, de denied. Uh, sorry, is, this, is workshop chat, then we allow it. And they must disclose themselves and we're going to cache it. So Crossbar doesn't have to ask again for the same set of conditions. Um, and if you actually subscribe and the start is workshop chat, and then we're also going to allow it. But in this case, I didn't publish to workshop.chat. I published to workshop.test and it didn't let me. Let's try doing it to workshop chat. Um, and yeah, I've prepared workshops of the thread things here. Published workshop chat test. Hey, it worked. So if we go and check this again, we can see that um, it's authorized that action for the call, and then it's authorized my publish. Fantastic. Um, and so obviously now I can write any logic I want in here. And obviously I can also use the exact same logic in here to go to my application to say, can this user do something? Um, and that is how you would build, start building out a proper authentication system. Um, now I am aware that we are probably looking at finishing up in the next 10 minutes. Um, so uh, firstly, I should remind you, uh, please ask questions. Um, I haven't seen any come through so far. And hopefully that means you're all following along wonderfully and you're gonna go home and, and I say go home, you're already home. What am I, what am I saying? Um, hopefully you're gonna go to the desk that you work at from home because we all live in our houses now forever um, and build a webhook application. Um, but if that's not the case, please do ask some questions because I'd love to help you out and build something really cool. Um, we're going to look at one more thing, and this is how your application can not only be, act as a kind of background, you know, uh, oh yes, this user is allowed or this user has this permission, but your application can kind of get involved in the whole WebSocket system because the chances are your application is already doing a lot of things. So your web application is recording users who log in, your web application is handling messages that come in from a variety of sources, maybe messages that are coming in by email or messages that are coming in um, via an existing form on your site. Now you don't want to rebuild your entire architecture around WebSockets. I mean, it'd be cool if you could, but you probably don't have the time. Um, so instead you want your application to start talking back to your crossbar system so that when you've got a dashboard that indicates new user signups or when you've got a chat message that's going to take a message from an email that comes in, you can send that into your WebSocket system without having to rebuild your entire stack. And so I'm going to quickly preview how you do that. Um, and like I said, we don't really have time to go into huge amounts of detail on it, uh, but hopefully it gives you a flavor of what can be achieved. And you can see from PHP Storm that I've already modified these files because I kind of knew ahead of time we wouldn't have the time to type it all up. So I'm going to kind of walk you through it. Um, so in order to do a, um, essentially what we, we're going to test out of a broadcast, right? So any user signed up to your platform, we want the ability to broadcast to all of them. 
Um, so kind of like a sort of at here message on Slack that you hate your team for doing. Um, and so we've added a new guest. Um, and hopefully you can follow along the green lines on the side of my ID that show the new code I added to achieve this. Um, and this code's called Broadcaster. And it's a similar principle to Authenticator, same, same socket we're connecting to, different password. Um, but it's another PHP file. Um, this time we're actually creating our own uh, React event loop. Um, and the reason for that is because we're not using just a connection, uh, we're using something else. We're using a, a socket. Um, and React provides support for a thing called ZMQ. Uh, this is a really cool message queue system that doesn't require an entire message queue server to be running. Um, although obviously, again, you can run Rabbit or you can run um, Redis or anything else you want to. Um, but ZMQ is cool because it basically just runs a part of your React process. Um, and you basically get a socket through React. Um, so we're going to open the socket up to any IP address and we're going to have a port, and this is defined as an NVAR, so this comes in through our Docker Compose file in this case, but obviously in your application, it could come through, well, however you define your environment variables. Um, and we're gonna create a socket, a pull socket. So we're gonna bind onto our address, and then when we receive a message, um, we're going to, in this case, uh, log it, and then we're gonna publish it back out. Okay, so why might we do this? Okay, so say you've got users using your application, and you want to tell everyone, hey, server's going out for maintenance. You want everyone to get that message. Um, and so you build into your application the ability to send a message into your broadcaster. So your broadcaster here is sitting, it's opened a socket on this port that's external. Um, so again, you might want to have some sort of password on this <laughs> or you, you know, just link it, uh, isolate it inside your own network or something. Um, and so we're now going to have a, an endpoint. Again, we're in Slim here. So we're going to post request a broadcast that's going to send this message um, and it's going to take a password. So this is on your front end, so your, sorry, your, your PHP side that's going to take a password. Um, and then it's going to do this. This is the sort of stuff you might not have seen before in PHP. Um, so we're going to get a TCP socket address. So crossbar six is my name for my Docker compose file. Um, we're going to open a ZMQ context. This is from the XZMQ extension, um, uh, which is well supported and can be installed by Peckle. Um, and that's going to basically we know that someone's running a pull socket, so we're going to load a push socket, um, and we're going to connect to this address, and then we're going to send our message. And again, this message can just be any sort of text. We're just sending a TTP connection here. So this isn't inside the kind of web socket way of doing things. Um, but what we are doing is sending a message into um, a worker running in our WebSocket environment. And that worker has a sort of persistent connection to our WebSocket service. Um, so just to demonstrate what we're doing here before we, before we close off, um, uh, da, 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 da. we need to log in and I think Mike should still work. Yeah, we're connected and you see we've added this. Well, auto subscribe to broadcast messages. Yes, subscribe to workshop broadcast. Okay, so we've subscribed to our broadcast thread here. And now we can open this and again, uh, previously tested this out. Um, so we've got our broadcast and we're gonna send the message test broadcast. And just to go through what that's gonna do, that's gonna hit our Slim application, post broadcast. It's gonna check our password because you know, a bit of security is always sensible. Um, and then it's going to look for the address of our um, crossbar service. And it's gonna to link to the ZMQ socket on that service and send this message in. The reason we're using this ZMQ socket rather than just creating a um, crossbar connection in our PHP application as an external client is again, if you imagine you've got lots of these messages going through. So say you're pinging a message every single time a user completes an order. Um, you don't want to have to handle that entire negotiation process of like uh, signing into the crossbar router for every single time. Um, this is much more raw. You're just literally firing a TCP request um, and you're not even checking you know, if it's finished. You're just, you're just firing it. Um, so you might not want to use this if you need confirmation, but then again, you can send the confirmation back by another channel. So there's, there's ways to handle it. This is great for things like, uh, yeah, for chat, live chat systems, um, or for that like, dashboards. So, you know, you, a new order came in, great, show it on the dashboard. Um, and so that's how we're going to do this. And again, it's a really nice way of decoupling your application architecture, because obviously this is sending into your crossbar server, but you could send this into anything that, that's, that's, that can handle an incoming TCP connection. Um, and so, you know, the moment you've been waiting for, we're going to hit this. And now we see here, got a message to the broadcast. So what we've done is we've sent a message to our Slim application. That's made a socket connection into our crossbar service. And our, oops, our broadcaster here 
has received it. We can check crossbars logs here. Um, unless I'm on the wrong one. Probably I'm on the wrong one, Solanta. Yeah, five. Send that again. There we go. So our broadcaster here received the message test broadcast and I've published it out to everyone else. Um, and that's kind of the, the sort of, I guess, other pillar. So we've covered um, quite a few things in a very short amount of time. Your head is maybe spinning. I'm sorry about that. Um, but we've looked at how uh, crossbar works and how uh, web application messaging protocol functions um, and how therefore you can use these things together to make a real time application using web sockets from your browser. Um, and we've also seen how you can use your existing backend to authenticate your users, um, how your users don't have to send their secrets um, over the wire. They can um, sign something to, to confirm their login and how your application can also define the permissions, the distinct permissions a user has on your infrastructure and what they can publish, subscribe, or register, or call. Um, finally, we've seen how we can utilize our application to go the other way and send data from our application back into our, our real-time architecture to send messages to users, to update dashboards, or to do anything else that, that you might feel you want to do with your application. Um, there are some other sort of aspects of this, but that covers a lot of the main things you might want to do uh, with this kind of system. Um, so uh, at that point, I will um, hand over to questions. Ah, I see. I've got one already, so I'm just going to launch straight into it. So Jonathan Jeffries is asking, why crossbar? Are there alternatives? Is it an equivalent built on React PHP or AMP PHP? Um, so the uh, answer is there are most likely plenty of alternatives. Um, there are, this, this is a technology that's been around for over well over a decade. Um, in terms of PHP, um, yes, there's a system called Ratchet. Um, Ratchet is not necessarily a um, like a full Again, it's not, not, it's not like a full router that you just use out of the box. Ratchet is a library that allows you to build your own router. Um, so Ratchet sits on top of React, um, and Ratchet will allow you to talk um, to things like WAMP connections. Um, and when, in the early days when I was experimenting with Crossbar, um, I did play with Ratchet as well. Um, ultimately, I just found that Crossbar seemed to have all the features I needed, so that rather than building it in Ratchet, I was just going to use Crossbar. Similar to how you probably use Nginx or Apache, uh, even though React could actually also act as a web server, um, you probably still use you know, a, a pre-built web server. Um, I, I kind of see it the same with, with, with uh, Crossbar. Um, it also does help that, again, the people behind the WAMP specification are the people behind Crossbar. So there's a lot of links. Um, and the Autobahn JS library is also theirs. So uh, that maybe you know, that could be too many people controlling one part of the ecosystem, but I, I feel that it, it sort of makes sense. Um, so hopefully that uh, answers that one. But ultimately, you know, it's up to you. Go out, use Ratchet and React, build a router that's maybe simpler than Crossbar or uh, does a specific feature better. I don't know. Um, it'd be really interesting to see what people would build in that sense. Uh, but most likely you want to build your own applications. Thank you very much for that talk, Mike, uh, well, that, that live demo. That's uh, it's great. It's fantastic. Thank you very much for that. No problem. Thanks. Thanks, thanks a lot.